sound the gates. Economic inequality is ripping America apart. Indeed, Danziger 12 of the University of Michigan explains that economic growth almost exclusively benefits the rich. Worse yet, Stiglitz 15 of Columbia University explains that economic inequality becomes political inequality, allowing wealth to beget power, which begets more wealth. As a result, Gillen 16 of Princeton University reveals that the economic elite have more political power than over half of American citizens. Inequality damages social cohesion, worsens living conditions, and prices of poor out of quality medical care and education. As a result, Ms. Ruchka 12 of the University of Washington finds that inequality in America needlessly kills nearly a million Americans annually. Our first contention is pricing out the poor. Iglesias 17 of Vox explains that every tax reform since the 80s has remained revenue neutral. Unfortunately, abolishing the capital gains tax would strike the largest blow to government revenue in American history, as the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities in 08 explains that just a 5% decrease in the capital gains tax adds $100 billion to the deficit. Padgett 10 of the Tax Foundation finds that when an urgent need of revenue, the U.S. turns towards what are known as excise taxes, which are paid by consumers buying a specific good like gasoline. This is because, as Packet explains, these excise taxes are easy to pass under the guise of decreasing consumption of goods harmful to society. Unfortunately, these taxes rarely work and instead hurt the poor because these basic necessities take up a bigger chunk of their total budget. Indeed, the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy finds that these excise taxes cost the poor 22 times more than the rich. Our second contention is urban poverty. Inner city America is in a state of ruin, as Kang 16 of New York Times reports that while unemployment is low across America, in inner cities it hovers around 40%. The root issue is investment, as Porter 95 finds that because investment in low income areas is inherently risky, investors turn away from investing there unless there is a comparative advantage in doing so. Luckily, recent policy has achieved just that, as Bank 18 of Impact Alpha reports that the new Investing for Opportunities Act passed last December lets investors reduce their capital gains tax rate if they invest in distressed communities for seven years. Ultimately, Brown 17 of the medium quantifies that this will incentivize investors to direct over $2 trillion in unrealized capital gains into startups, small businesses, and infrastructure in impoverished communities. This creates a ripple effect across the inner city as first 12 of the University of Chicago quantifies that poor communities that are accessible to investment hubs experience a 23% reduction in poverty. Unfortunately, abolishing the capital gains tax reverses recent progress and harms low-income communities in two ways. The first is rent. Victoria University in 09 explains that abolishing the capital gains tax would make land investments more desirable by letting owners retain profit, increasing property prices. Unfortunately, Davis 15 of Rutgers finds that as property values rise, rent increases, leading Putland 15 of the University of Queensland to conclude that eliminating the capital gains tax would increase the cost of housing by 31%. Higher property and rental prices create a cycle of displacement which creates a poverty trap. Burn 13 of the University of Pennsylvania quantifies the harms, finding that just a $100 increase in rent is associated with a 15% increase in homelessness. Luckily, negating prevents matters from worsening as Coleman 17 finds that because capital gains taxes deflate housing prices, negating lowers the cost of rent in the long run. Second is subsidizing white flight. Shapiro of Randalls explains that the benefits of repealing the capital gains tax are highly concentrated among whites because of structural advantages in buying, selling, and utilizing capital, thereby limiting benefits experienced by African Americans. Davis 92 of the University of Chicago observes that in the past, cuts have created investment exclusively in suburban areas, effectively subsidizing white flight. Haynes 10 of Wesleyan apparently finds that white flight increases unemployment in low-income areas by 1.5%, creating a poverty trend. For all these reasons, I negate. We affirm and contention on the in venture capital. Currently, we are entering the office of the North Carolina Nation Fire, and only 0.05% of startups are funded with venture capital funds. Despite this, venture capitalists are extremely effective at identifying potentially successful companies. Specifically, Will Gornow of Stanford University quantifies that 43% of companies large enough to have a public IPO were once funded by venture capital investment. Identifying promising startups is especially important today, as Heather Long of CNN Money reports that new business creation in the U.S. is at a nearly 40-year low. 
how do we capital gains tax would increase venture capital funding for two reasons. And the first is by reducing the price of investment. Taxing investment profit reduces the will to invest. Absent a capital gains tax, investment thus increases. Kevin Milligan at Northwestern University confirms that every 4% reduction in capital gains taxes increases net investment by about 2%. The potential for investment is huge. The Economic Innovation Group quantifies that U.S. investors currently hold $2.3 trillion in unrealized capital gains. Second is by enabling portfolio diversification. Carl Stein of Bloomberg notes that in the status quo, there's been a 65% increase in passive investment, which consists mostly of large, slow-growing companies. When the capital gains tax is cut, investors are more inclined to spread their investment out to new areas. Historically, this benefits small businesses. Stephen Moore of the Institute for Policy and Innovation confirms that when capital gains taxes were cut historically, the stock of smaller firms outperform, outperforms that of larger firms. Specifically, every 5% cut in capital gains taxes increases small business stock value by 12.5%. Thus, Paul Gompers of the Harvard Business School concludes that every 1% decrease in the capital gains tax rate was associated with a 3.8% increase in venture capital funding. There are two impacts, and the first is driving wage and job growth. Cornell of Stanford University explains that formerly venture capital funded companies employ 50% of all Americans. Furthermore, small startups are the engine for job creation, as more of the Tax Policy Center indicates that 80% of new jobs are created by small companies. Thus, Alex and I of the ACCF projects that abolishing the capital gains tax would create over 1.3 million jobs per year. Second is driving innovation. Cornell of Stanford University explains that startups funded by venture capital funds are responsible for 82% of technological innovations. Furthermore, Jennifer Alsever of Fortune notes that 64% of dedication approved in recent years originated from small startups and increasingly generate the lion's share of innovative drugs. American medical technology isn't just sold in America. The National Bureau of Economic Research quantifies that in both developing and developed countries, new medical technology has been responsible for 73% of the increase in life expectancy. Contention two is foreign direct investment. Investopedia finds that the U.S. tax code imposes a tax on gains from abroad, including foreign direct investment. That dissuades investment in other countries. The OECD indicates that each 1% increase in investment taxes decreases the amount of FDI by 4%. Because America represents a fourth of global foreign direct investment, the consequences of hampering FDI are massive. Investing in the developing world is essential for improving quality of life. Pedro Martins of the University of London indicates that foreign firms pay their workers 77 more percent more than domestic firms. This facilitates a process of competition where domestic firms have to increase their wages in order to compete with foreign companies in the long term. Ultimately, wage competition leads to poverty reduction. Daniel Mirza of the OECD concludes that foreign direct investment has reduced global poverty rates by 32%. Because 3 billion people still live under $2.50 a day, poverty reduction facilitated by investment is critical for lifting billions out of poverty. Thus, we affirm. So, so can you just like swap it? Pretty sure the cards are over here? Yeah. Yeah. So, roll it Cards are on. What's going on? Uh, oh, do you have to like get text of the case? Oh, uh, yeah, that's about it. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it is included. Yeah, so you guys have to cross the file and you look at this. Yeah, can yeah. you see the cards for this? Oh, uh, no, it's not like it's not like you can just get like PDFs. You can call the ones you want after the files. Okay, can, I, well, can we just like hold on to the laptop then just do it so I can see what's going on? Okay. Yeah, actually, just before we start, so cool. uh, there is one question that you want to call for. Uh, that's your uh, more evidence on your second warning. And then also, if I can see your, uh, run, or your, your long evidence on your topic. Uh, it's the 40 year low for small
For FDI. You say that FDI is responsible for like 30 per, uh, 32% of like global poverty reduction, right? Mm -hmm. How much FDI do you actually increase? I mean, the OECD evidence indicates that we increase the capital gains tax rate by 1%, we decrease the amount of FDI flow by 4%. Even if that's not entirely reversible, I would say it's pretty indicative of the fact that capital gains taxation decreases the amount of FDI flow. But so, can I ask you a question? Hang on. If we are only decreasing the total amount of FDI, but you don't cite a single author who says that you would actually increase net FDI, Wait, hold on. what is the actual gains, impact this of this like other logical, than as a disadvantage? Right? This is like pretty logical, right? If capital gains taxes reduces the amount of FDI flow, then getting rid of capital gains taxes then increases the amount of FDI flow. Then like, why it's didn't, pretty then, logical. But then, why, but then why didn't they say that? Why aren't you citing and saying I mean, that cutting the capital gains rate would increase that? It's because I didn't find like 16 different authors that said something extremely logical. Based on the you found zero the authors OECD. that indicated that, right? I mean, my my concern matter. is that if the OECD indicates that the capital gains tax is a barrier to FDI flow, then I would say getting rid of the barrier increases FDI flow. That's incredibly logical, and I'm going to ask you a question now. So, when you talk about how tax reform has to be revenue neutral, the 2017 tax reform bill, was that revenue neutral? Like, I would say, like, totally it eventually would be. Yes. Wait, what? So, was it revenue neutral right off the bat? Or, wait, hang on. So, like, when you're talking about, we were talking about cuts or whatever. So, like, we just said tax reform has to be revenue neutral. So, the 2017 yes. tax reform no. bill, was that revenue neutral? The 2017 tax reform bill is different in nature from what we're talking about in case. You just said tax if you are, reform. If you are cutting something that cuts hundreds of billions of dollars that's into the U.S. Said. federal revenue. That's not what you said. You said least. tax reform has to be revenue neutral. So, yes. the so words that you what, read in what case you, what that you I'm say, responding to now, what you was say the 2017 yeah. tax reform law revenue neutral? Like, was it yes or no? Well, it is a very simple question. Yes. How? Because like it led to borrowing and huge deficits, right? Wait, it hasn't kicked in yet. Like it's projected or from projected the, to it's like, projected I mean, from the CBO so, to like, run up huge deficits. Regardless of that, hang on. Even, uh, hang, like allow me, allow, allow me to allow me to delineate the two. Sure. Right? So you're talking about a bill that was planned and like passed had to, or, and passed. passed. Sure. Like this was a passed bill. You were talking about an unplanned tax abolition, right? So in nature, the two a politically and be functionally operate very okay. separately so, from one another. I'm gonna ask you two different questions. First of all, we have is, 10 if we can prove, so yeah, we just do one. Uh, <laughs> let's see if we have time for two. The first one is that if we can prove that a capital gains tax will pay itself uh, itself off eventually, like the 2017 bill is like maybe supposed to do. Does that get rid of your wink? No. Because if you were paying it off in the long term, but the short term but that's what the 2017 bill is supposed if, to do. It's if, supposed to run up short term deficits, and then the Republicans say that it's going to pay itself off yeah. in the long term. I'm not here, so the I'm not here to debate you about the thing. 2017 tax bill. You said but tax you, reform. This if, is about if, tax reform. If, if you create static harms that will not be paid off in the long term, I say we, like you still garner some harms. Oh yeah, can I, sorry, can I see the 82% in the ratio of uh, yeah. 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 This is going to be
reallocates all the distribution to the upper class, which doesn't help the quality of life of anyone. With that in mind, let's start with contention one about venture capitalism. On face, you can deal with the argument because hung for 12 the Congressional Research Service estimates over 65 years of data that cutting capital gains does not lead to an increase in investment. The Warren comes from Berman 97, who finds that most, exempt, uh, most investment comes from tax-exempt pension funds, which is never actually affected by cutting the capital gains tax. A vote for them does not increase investment on net. But then, they pretty much talk about how new startups are going to be formed. Rivlin 11 explains three barriers to startups. The first is that interest rates are a much bigger indicator of not starting up a business, and that's going to exist in either world. They never change that. But second, realize that people will just invest in things like tax havens, like gold and other commodities, and not actually grow the economy. But then third, realize that people will always profit if they have a business. Because the tax on capital gains is only a tax on profits, they don't necessarily show that the tax is a disincentive to start a business in the first place. At that point, they have no top shelf offense. But then they talk about an increase in venture capitalism. McDermott 12 of the INC finds that 75% of venture capital that startups fail. On scope, they're only encouraging an increase in failure. If anything, you turn the argument against them, because Kane 17 finds that venture capitalists push investors and companies towards growth, which is unsustainable and accumulates debt. A vote for them leads to failed businesses starting, which is comparatively worse than what's happening in the status quo. Then, they specifically talk about how there's going to be portfolio diversification. First realize that investors are always going to diversify their portfolios when you learn the first day of economics class. But second, we would argue that you turn the argument against them. Because Mitchell of Case Western University basically explains that if you cut the capital gains tax, you'll see an increase in speculation. Assets and bubbles will eventually form, so a vote for them leads to unsustainable bubbles, which eventually caused for the 08 recession, according to Iglesias of Vox. Even more so, what we would contend is that they're not actually creating jobs. The warrant comes from Dayton 17 of the nation who finds that when companies have more money, they engage in what's known as stock buybacks. So instead of expanding the output of the actual business, they're just reinvesting into themselves, which doesn't create jobs for anyone, and only worsens income inequality, which magnifies the link into our case. Specifically, they impact out to actually increasing R&D. First, their argument is on need. As the AIP 16 finds that R&D spending and innovation in the status quo is at an all-time high. They don't show that we actually need to reduce the capital gains tax to trigger any of the benefits that they talk about. At that point, don't grant them offense on this point. If anything, though, you always vote for us because we lead to more successful startups. Box 17 finds that when capital gains tax rates are higher, investors are more selective in picking successful startups. She concludes that a higher tax burden increases the likelihood of future successful startups. A vote for us ensures that these businesses have a path towards sustainability while they're only pushing them towards unsustainable growth. Very specifically, they read Sinai, which says 1.3 million jobs are created. But the Sinai card literally has no methodology. At that point, you prefer the Berman analysis, which is 65 years of data, which says that they don't increase investment whatsoever. With that in mind, let's go to their second contention about increasing foreign direct investment. On phase, foreign direct investment wouldn't go up because investing in developing countries is always inherently risky. They never actually change that opportunity cost. If anything, we would argue that foreign direct investment is bad for a couple of reasons, though. The first comes from Baker 15 of the Economic Policy Institute explains that inflow of FDI causes prices to fall and discourages local entrepreneurs and businesses. Baker concludes that a 10% increase in FDI uh, increases the probability of a business failing by 70%. But second, realize that FDI actually harms economic development according to Cup of the Institute for Economics because it undermines job development and it creates lax regulations which harms the workers. So if you vote for them, workers are going to be abusing these developing countries, undermining the thesis of their case. But finally, we would argue that it undermines undermines democracy. Because the model of NYU in 2015 explains that FDI undermines democracy and undemocratic institutions as foreign institutional corporations work with the government to ensure that they're protected and the workers are left out of the picture. Insofar as democracy outweighs the entity of their case because it leads to sustainable policies, you always prefer the sustainability garnered in our world, and that's why we need to do it. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to 
start rebuttal by profiling, you can begin your flow at a speculation term, and then I will go to their case after that. Is everyone ready? Starting on the term, they say there's an increase in speculation. The Financial Times indicates that 84% of investment right now is already highly speculative. They don't make the problem that much worse. Then, second of all, they talk about stock buybacks. We would first of all say when stocks are being bought back, that's a good thing because an investor gets some money and they, the investor gets money and they literally reinvest it somewhere else in the economy. Second of all, stock buybacks are something that occurs with big companies that don't have any room to put money elsewhere. Our contention is about small companies. Then, they say this idea about there's going to be a total increase in number of successful companies. Their evidence is flawed. What it's basically saying is that when investors have less money, they have to be more selective. Well, that might be true. You might be an investor thinking between Uber and Snapchat. Sure, Uber's going to succeed, but not investing in Snapchat is also a bad idea. We would say we increase the total quantity of successful companies, and that's ultimately the most important. Let's go to our condition two about FBI. First of all, they say that investment is always risky, so we don't increase or decrease it. Actually, we do. We tell you, first of all, historically, each 1% increase in the tax decreased investment 4%, and the reason why that's logically sound is because profit margins go down, which means you don't want to make a risky investment. Then, second of all, they say that prices decreased by a significant amount when foreign direct investment went in. They try to frame this as a good, like a bad thing. This is a good thing in the long term when consumers are able to access life-saving technology, food, goods. Even though they're saying that some companies fail in the short term, in the long term, less people starve, more people are wealthy, that's a good thing. Then, they say this idea about lax regulations is going to harm the people. If anything, we would say that in the long term, while there might be short-term idea of like bad democracy and bad regulations, in the long term, foreign direct investment creates good and sound economies. You can look to the book, Why Nations Fail, where they tell you that in the long term, the creation of a middle class facilitates fighting for rights, which is why across the board we can see in countries like China, even though initially there was a decrease in human rights, in the long term, Chinese people are much better off because of the increase in foreign direct investment. It's a trend that we see across the world and across the board. Let's go down their case. Starting on their overview, they first of all say that income inequality is bad and it's going to stunt growth and stuff like that. But the Atlantic indicates that even as income inequality has spiked in the last 40 years, we have seen poverty is only three-fourths of what it used to be. This means that poverty and income inequality are not inherently tied. If we are helping the poor, we can still see income inequality growing. If the poor are getting higher wages at the same time, that's a good thing. And in fact, they do when we cut the capital gains tax. Because the New York Times indicates what happens is stocks are going to increase around 15%. This benefits the low and middle income class because we tell you these people People have a lot of their money invested in 401ks. That means they can retire early, they have higher wealth, and ultimately that benefits everybody, not just the rich. Let's talk about their two contentions. First of all, I'm pricing out the poor. They say that our, our tax cuts are always going to be investment uh, tax neutral. This logically does not make any sense. For example, the 2017 tax bill, which decreased taxes and increased spending, that is not revenue neutral. We have to borrow more money in order to finance it. In fact, this is the crux of what we are saying here. When the government has a greater deficit, what they do is they borrow money. We know America loves to do this. We have a huge deficit and a great debt. We would say that at the end of the day, we're not going to be financing this bill by increasing taxes, which Republicans hate doing, but by borrowing more money. But even then, we would turn the argument because the IPI indicates that capital gains taxes are so economically efficient, they increase tax revenue in other areas like income taxes and consumption taxes as our economy grows. At the end, they conclude there was actually an increase in tax revenue in the long term, turning their argument against them. Then, on their second convention about urban poverty. First of all, on their first impact on rent. They say that there's going to be more investment in housing. However, Investopedia indicates that right now, there already is no capital gains taxes on housing, which makes their impact very non-unique. Then, second of all, they talk about how there's going to be an increase in house investment. We would say most of that investment is going to occur in suburbs. The reason why is because in the inner cities, housing is an extremely bad investment. For example, we have all seen pictures of homes in Detroit. These houses tend to decrease in value. If you're a speculative investor, you invest in the suburbs, like their second impact says. That's not going to price the poor out. Then, second of all, on white flight. Their argument is only bad if the poor get poor while the rich get richer. However, the poor ultimately get wealthier with a cut in the capital gains tax. What Cato indicates is that this cut increases real wages for both the poor and the rich. On top of that, historically these cuts led to an increase in black owned businesses, which shows these cuts ultimately help everybody. So as long as this white flight is occurring while the poor are getting richer, it won't necessarily be that bad. We urge you to vote for the affirmative team. <laughs>
Is you're saying that FDI goes up only if there's a net influx of growth after the capital gains tax, right? Like there's a no, net increase. They've just, we are saying FDI goes up because it costs less to invest. There's okay. no tax increase. That's our argument. You have a question. So, yeah, sure. Um, so would you say the poor are worse off in America or in the third world? I would say in the third world. Okay, so then why would your impact about these poor income people in America outweigh the impact of those who are poor? Are you saying that poverty in America doesn't matter? It does so matter. As far as Ms. Rufus says that a million people die each and every year due to income inequality, we still have okay, your Ms. Rufus evidence is about the poor getting poor. Because if the poor get wealthier, they can afford food, so education, or they are less likely to die. Poor with but wait, inequality. what about the why is due to okay. political uh, change? Sure, we can talk about that. Yeah. But let's talk back to my weighing analysis. For sure, poverty is horrible in America. What about in the developing world where three billion people live under two dollars and fifty cents a day? That's fine. Okay. So we would argue that A, the FDI going to the developing world isn't good FDI. B, we would say there isn't a net. No, wait, wait, I'm assuming that this is weighing analysis right now, not like who won which response. If we win our impact on FDI and you win your impact on the poor in America. Which one matters more? I mean, I would say that the poor in America could still definitely outweigh. The reason why is we could just go for weighing that basically says that external actors will be the one to provide FDI, and that if we actually so somebody else, else is going America, to do that, so we should wait, wait. America is one fourth of global FDI. Okay. So who is going to just step into our place? The other three fourths. Okay, that's not how FDI works. Okay, so. America is one fourth of FDI. If America is the one providing right, yeah. FDI, three fourths of the rest of the world can provide. That doesn't make sense. No. Can I have a question? Wait, wait, wait. Okay, sure. You can ask. Okay, but I will clarify that. Yeah. So let's talk about what the evidence that you read in rebuttal said. You said that houses aren't taxed from the capital gains tax. Right? Yeah. Okay. Are houses not taxed, or is there just an exemption up to five hundred thousand dollars? There's an exemption which significantly decreases. Okay. The so amount. houses are taxed, right? Yeah. It's okay. a very low so tax in the 90s. What? In 1997, what the federal government did was they passed something that made it significantly cheaper to invest in houses. But they that are is what tax, we speak right? of. But yes, there's a low tax. Cool, but that's the only tax. Yeah. You can yeah. ask another question. Oh, okay, cool. So let's uh, all right, yeah, let's talk about an increase in the amount of venture capital. Yeah. Trump recently had a corporate tax cut, right? Yep. Okay. So why did, did we see investment go up? When was the corporate tax cut? When was the corporate tax cut? I'm pretty sure his tax bill was passed like a month ago. Okay, so have we seen an investment? It's been a month. It I mean, why would it? Why would it? They haven't even implemented it. The no, government takes should, months to implement yeah, tax cuts. see a shift, right? Like empirically, a shift. The taxes seen. haven't even been so, cut yet. Right. The way the government yeah. operates yeah. is after yeah. a policy yeah. is passed, yeah. and it takes a few question. months up to a year to yeah. actually implement yeah. the policy. Yeah. Understanding my question. Yeah. So my question is: Is that the taxes are already going to get cut? Why doesn't the incentive to invest already exist? We can make the incentive even better. We say the more small businesses, Wait, it's the a binary. Better. You either invest or you don't. Right? What? So no, you invest. But that's every single investor has a binary. There are more investors that will choose to invest if you make their profitability higher. That is our argument. Okay. Yeah. So first. Um, we see that the capital gains tax on housing is Yeah, and then increasing tax revenue. Yeah, yeah, the tax revenue is more. Could you yeah. just show me the graph? Yeah, the definitely yeah. show yeah.
Okay, you guys ready? Yep. Perfect. Yep. We're all three judges. Okay, so we'll start on the overview, in their case, and my case. Everybody's ready? I'll start the time now. Starting on the overview, they drop the Stiglitz analysis, which says that economic inequality leads to political inequality, which leads to more economic inequality because the poor can no longer advocate for their economic rights, don't give them any long-term solvency on poverty, because the poor cannot advocate for their political rights, they cannot protect themselves from abusive economic policy in the future. That's why the Danziger analysis says that any long-term economic benefits that they create will only go towards the rich. Then, on their case, they drop all the current disincentives to investment, like interest rates or like tax havens. So when he says that after stock buybacks, they would reinvest into the economy, they would just reinvest into more stock buybacks because it was already profitable. What makes them choose one thing that's already profitable and then divert that away to something that is less profitable? They need to respond to the current disincentives or the current, uh, the current tax exemptions if they're going to win this argument. But then, on their second impact, remember, we increase the propensity for successful startups because John tells you that increasing the tax rate increases the success rate of these businesses, which means that as they succeed more, they can expand and employ more people. Then on FDI, remember, long-term FDI will not get better because as it decreases democracy, the poor cannot advocate for their rights, which means that you will not see political reform, which benefits them. That's why 7 million people die in the Congo every year. Then, on my contention, one, he says that the capital gains tax would increase tax revenue, but he doesn't uh, uh, account for uh, economic growth while it was being cut. He drops the, uh, the top half of urban poverty where we say that poverty in the inner cities has remained at 40% while the rest has decreased. That frontlines the overview, by the way. But additionally, Porter says that investment in inner cities is risky, yet the comparative advantage that these tax breaks that the current capital gains rate gives them means that $2 trillion will flood into inner cities. That's key because they've empirically decreased poverty rates by 23%. And when he talks about no capital gains rate on housing, the, t the money that you earn when you sell your, your house is taxed. And he talks about no investment in Detroit, but the Porter analysis frontlines that. I'm gonna start with press line. Sorry. Let's start on the overview. He drops the turn that James reads in the rebuttal where we tell you that when you increase stock prices by 20%, when you affirm the resolution, what that does is it increases the value of the poor and middle classes 401ks, which actually decreases income inequality in their world. Don't let John respond to that in final focus. It's way too late now. But the second one is he just tells you that there's going to be more political like, power inequality, for, uh, which means there's less rights for the poor. But he also drops the Atlantic analysis that James also reads you, which indicates that even though inequality is at an all-time high, the populace still won the last election, running on a, on a campaign for the poor, and overall poverty has been cut by 25%. The terminal impact to lives is derived off of poverty increasing. The poverty decreases in our world. They don't access the impact. But then on their second contention, where they talk about $2 trillion of funding into these poor communities and this, this housing tax. We would tell you from the Denver Post that they brought like the housing tax argument and also a turn on their case when the rich are given the opportunity to use these poor areas as a tax loophole. All they do is they fund real estate in that area, which increases gentrification and increases poverty overall. I would say that's a very good reason to also vote.
difficult for us. On our case, he extends the turn on venture capital where he tells you that we're going to have more successful venture capital companies. But no, when you increase the quantity of investment going to venture capital companies, these investors still have the incentive to pick out the ones that are going to work, which means that the amount of success still increases. Then, he tells you on FBI that democracy is going to be really bad. But the weighing is very important here. For the poor, their first concern is putting food on the table and their last concern is rights. When you give these people more, of, when you meet more of their basic needs by pulling them out of poverty, that gives them the power and the collective will to fight for rights in the future, which means that their whole thing about democracy solves itself back in the long term. At that point, we access the OECD evidence where we tell you that when you increase the amount of capital gains taxes, you decrease it by FDI by 4%. Martin's evidence tells you that when you have FDI, it increases more wage competitiveness because foreign firms pay 77% more, which means you have more competition for wages, which is why MRSA tells you it decreases poverty by 32%. The one piece of analysis we get you here is from John, where he says that someone else is going to step in when the U.S. doesn't invest. That doesn't make any sense. Other countries don't have more means to invest in FDI just because we choose not to. If I choose not to invest, that doesn't mean that James is inherently going to do so. We urge you to affirm. So let's talk about the increase in FDI. Yep. What, what company, like you talk about how historically FDI has gone up. Can you give me an example of one company that has provided beneficial foreign direct investment to a developing country? Yeah, any company that invests foreignly is like, we would say a good thing. They're Wait, increasing so wages, they're making people example. better off. I mean, when John Doe goes to the developing world and gives them tractors, that's pretty good. Like we would say, like in, in general, general there's an increase in like, the spread of best practice. Wait, best hang on, actually, not a good no, we could actually talk about like, like farming Wait, in the third world, like specifically in Colombia, right? Like there are actual, like, there, there, there are brand new responses about Colombia and the Grand Cross fire. I mean, you talked, I mean, you specified like John Doe, right? Like my 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 point is responsible. If you ask me for an like, example of good companies, I'm going to give you an example of a good company. That doesn't no. mean we start talking about Colombia. I'm about to explain to you why John Doe is not a good company. It's because John Doe doesn't give tractors to small farmers. John Doe gives tractors to large multinational companies that Wait, own so abusive that, like, plantations that irrigation. kill hundreds you're of saying, thousands of low-income Colombians. That, like, drip each irrigation, year. like malaria nests, have been bad for Africa. Like vaccines, medication, wait, 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 all these things are more direct investments provided by like other organizations like the UN, which is why we say yeah, well, so the, the UN will do their job on their own. They don't absent foreign, investment. absent foreign direct investment, we are literally leaving the third world on their own. We can't count on international organizations that don't have the clout or the power to do this themselves. Okay, so we you need some form of private you, investment. You misunderstand the nature of foreign direct investment. Okay, you guys have spent a minute foreign, already reading new responses. I like to ask a question. the nature of foreign direct investment, the way that we see it in the status quo, is not investing in small businesses in Africa, it's buying those it's small businesses in Africa yes, and then exploiting the people yes, who previously owned in, in the short term, some businesses get priced out because multinational companies pay 77% more. But that's good because that reduces poverty, increases quality of life, and in the long term, creates the formation of a middle class that can advocate for their own rights. Yeah. That's where democratization <laughs> yeah. But I'd like to ask you guys a question. Yeah. So let's talk about your investment in four areas. Do you think that rich people are like taking the best interest of poor people in, in heart yeah, when they invest in the about your responses, you guys never responded to opportunity zones and rebuttals, so I'll explain it. Wait, what we're basically we saying is that the current capital we don't want to answer your question. Sure, sure. All right. The current capital gains tax rate basically makes it so there's a comparative advantage to invest in these inner cities. That's why first finds that's why first finds there's been a twenty three percent reduction in poverty when we see similar things happen. So what our argument is ultimately that these people, these places are deprived of investment. So by giving them investment, wait, our argument, argument is that you're saying when the capital gains tax on housing was cut, there was an increase in gentrification. So from that logical like standpoint, we would say the wealthy are more likely to invest in wait, houses. Wait, that is both driving up housing prices. That is both a front line that I read in the summary that functions as a turn yeah, because if you increase investment, cut, it increases gentrification. Yeah, a cut to taxes drives up housing prices, which leads to wait. You're advocating for a cut in taxes and low income areas. It's, isn't it's, that what your advocacy no, is? No, it's a no. It's, it's, a, tax, it's, a, tax, it's a tax rate. rate. So there's no longer like, taxes on investing in houses in these areas. There's no capital gains. Tax. That, that, that was untrue. Yeah. 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 
So if a loss happens, it's going to come down to their case, or their case, I'll start on their side of the My partner is yeah. Everybody's ready. Are all three judges ready? Everybody's ready. All of their cases predicate the idea that the amount of investment goes up, but they never respond to the Rivlin analysis that says that if you cut capital gains, the money's going to go to tax havens like gold, which doesn't expand the economy. There's other loopholes that they create in their world, which means that economic output doesn't go up. That is why Brian drops the Hungford analysis, which says that investment doesn't go up after 65 years of data when you look to capital gains tax cuts, they don't show that the incentive changes. At the end of the day, we see that current exemptions and current incentives are enough to stimulate investment. They never coherently respond to this, which also detaches them from any of their FDI arguments. In fact, we would argue that investment in our world is better. That is the Bach analysis that says that when there's a higher opportunity cost to invest, you have more selective investments, and you're more willing to make sure that the startup is successful. So they vote for us to a path of sustainable startups, which is always going to outweigh their case and functions as a prerequisite to any of the FDI they talk about. Then on FDI, they say that people need food before they can bargain for their rights, but we're telling you these people literally won't get food. Because when you look to FDI, 7% business failure increases, people are pushed out, and the money only goes to large multinational corporations excluding the poor. Aramo finds that democracy is undermined, and this function is a prerequisite. Because if I do not have rights, I finally cannot advocate for them in the long term. It creates a cycle of poverty which kills millions. But let's look to our side of the flow. First, they say that stock prices are going to go up, increasing 401k values. But we tell you that even with that disproportionately, income inequality is going to be rich. The Danziger evidence says that a vote for that means that growth is going to go to the upper class, which only widens inequality and political inequality in America, which leads to systemic traps of poverty. They say that poverty has been reduced, but look to the Kang evidence, which says that unemployment in inner cities is still at 4%, higher than the rest of America. A vote for us gives them a way out, because with the current capital gains tax rate, they have an opportunity cost, an incentive to invest in these inner cities, which lifts millions of people out of poverty, which is a huge impact, and that leaves their case on scope. Ultimately, though, they say that tax loopholes and cuts to housing ultimately led to changes in housing prices. Our argument is ultimately, you cut the capital gains tax, housing prices go up, people are pushed out, and now they're homeless. When people have inequality and they're in poverty, they can't advocate for their rights. That is a cyclical harm, and that's why we engage. Thank you all for joining. They drop the crucial term that income inequality is only bad when the poor get poor, not when both the poor and the rich get wealthier. We tell you historically, the Cato evidence indicates that cutting the capital gains tax increased the value of 401k, led to more employment, and ultimately increased real wages for both the poor and the wealthy. That means we are directly turning their case that goes cold drops. Even then, on urban poverty specifically, they try to make this advocacy about if the capital gains tax is cut, we're going to be seeing more investment in housing. Like Brian tells you from the Denver Post, their advocacy is literally to cut the capital gains tax only in low-income communities. That's why the Denver Post pauses. All we're going to be seeing is wealthy people putting their money in these communities, driving up housing prices, which is why historically these programs only led to increased gentrification. Even then, I'll outweigh it even if you grant them their full impact. Let's go to our case. First, on sustainable startups. We don't even go for this convention, but the response to this term is simple. We tell you venture capitalists are always looking to make more money. If they get more chance to invest, they're going to invest in the best possible companies. Consequently, even if the rate of failure is slightly higher, the number of ultimately successful companies goes up. Let's go to our second convention about foreign direct investment. They only say that like taxes are not going to incentivize investment. Their co entire case is about how taxes incentivize investment in lower income communities. But on top of that, the OEC evidence specifically studying foreign direct investment indicates historically each 1% tax cut led to a 4% increase in investment. We would say that's fundamentally true. Then they say they're only going to invest in tax havens. That makes no sense. If a tax is cut, you're not going to invest in where there is no tax anymore. You invest in productive areas where you can get the most return on investment, which is a business. Then, they re-extend this idea of 7% of businesses failing. We say this process is facilitated by larger companies coming in with higher wages. That's why some small companies fail. However, in the long term, this is a good thing because we see a significant reduction in poverty. 
Then we tell you this is extremely good because when the poor are rich, we tell you there's a 33% decrease in the rate of poverty because of that 77% increase in wages. We tell you that forms democracy in the long term. This outweighs their entire case for two reasons. First, on scope. We're talking about one fourth of the FDI affecting billions of people. That outweighs their case. Second of all, on magnitude, poverty in the third world is much more severe than it is in America. If poverty in the third world means starvation and death, and thus we are to vote for the affirmative team.